personality and 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 where I want to take my research program. So being invited to speak in this webinar is, is really meaningful to me. Oh, okay, sorry. All right. So as mentioned in the in the introduction, I study mother's milk as uh, the defining characteristics of the mammalian class that includes humans and all, all their mammals. They produce milk to provide nutrition and other features to their infants. And this adaptation that's been shaped by natural selection for millions of years has allowed mammals to do some really incredibly amazing things. So we can give birth to young in environments that don't have food for them, right? As you can see from these got seals in the lower corner. And the dynamic of a mother uh, nourish or, or a mother or an aloe mother nourishing their young allows the development of social bonds and social relationships to facilitate learning and cultural transmission and any number of other key features that make mammals mammals or in the in, the, in terms of uh, culture humans human. However, one of the things that's quite um, important is that what has happened is because milk is ubiquitous in our environment, we can go to the grocery store, there's an entire aisle of dairy products. And with the cultural advent of the use of formula, people have begun to underestimate what milk is and, 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 and how it seems. So as a result, people tend to take milk for granted. And luckily, uh, in the last two years, I've encountered this less, but when I first started doing my research uh, as a graduate student and as a postdoc, I would encounter a lot of people that would say, why are you studying milk? Don't we already know about it? And um, <laughs> the classic thing you get from people that you know have thought about it for about 30 seconds. And um, I imagine a lot of us encounter when we talk about our research widely. And the fact of the matter is, is that because milk is ubiquitous and standardized, we end up being in a danger zone. And this is a, a space where because we take it for granted, we have set up situations in which uh, there's misinformation, there's a lack of support for breastfeeding, and there's a perpetuation of a number of obstacles that mothers and others encounter um, from being able to meet their goals for raising their, their infants and children. And so the first part of my talk is really about how to get away from this danger zone. And, and the things that I talk about when it comes to mother's milk, both with my colleagues that are working in my particular area of science, at the intersections with other disciplines, and when I speak more publicly about milk. So um, the outline for this portion of the presentation um, has an improbably large motorcyclist on the wrong side of the road who is driving away from this danger zone where people seem to think that mother's milk is understood, it's simple, it's standard, and that the effects of it are minor. And I think that this is particularly going to be that last part quite interesting to all subfields of anthropology. So let's begin with milk is understood. Actually, it's not. We don't right now know everything that is in milk. We don't have a systematic library of all of the constituents. We don't entirely understand how all of the constituents that we do know about, how they get into milk, what those path, um, what those uh, mechanisms are, both physiological and cultural. And we have a very dim understanding of what milk does when it's ingested by the infant. So, if I put in um, keywords into the PubMed uh, search engine, which is maintained by the National Institutes of Health and the you know, uh, National Library, these are the number of articles that you get back um, in response to that. So, so basically what this figure is telling us is that we know orders of magnitude more about pregnancy than we do about breast milk composition. And this should make all of us very angry because this is the quintessential characteristic of mammals and is a really important feature for optimal early life beginning. So we know, when we, when we talk about what we do know, we know about the super function of the mammary gland in terms of uh, incredible amounts of physiological dairy science. 
we know about the dysfunction of, uh-oh, I lost you guys. Uh, we're still my... here, but we're just oh, seeing your desktop. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. All right. Okay. We know about the dysfunction of the mammary gland. So there's a substantial amount of research effort that's sent towards studying uh, cancer in the mammary gland. And this makes very, very good sense because one in eight Americans American women are going to develop breast cancer in their lifetime, and one in about 200 men. However, let's think about these numbers and consider that one in two women are going to have children. So in terms of the number of women that may be potentially impacted by a better understanding of the function of the mammary gland, it's quite larger numbers. You will see, oh my gosh, constantly on the news media articles comparing breastfeeding to formula feeding, as though these are necessarily the most optimal approaches to understanding breast milk and what it does. Because formula, while it's very standardized, one of the next things I'll tell you about is how variable mother's milk is. And, and also, treating it as though it's a dichotomous variable where mothers are either breastfeeding or formula feeding. When so many mothers are doing mixed feeding or transition feeding, um, is somewhat misleading. And last, the actual function, the behavioral biology of lactation, and for humans, the cultural context in which it's occurring is what is understood absolutely the least. And if anybody has any questions, because I'm in my in presentation mode, I can't see if any questions pop up, but um, Vernon, will you just verbally alert me if there's questions people have as I go through? Will do, yep. Awesome, thanks. And I've argued that we need to understand more about breast milk um, because we're facing a number of public health uh, crises. So for the first time in, in human history, more people's health is threatened by being overweight than by being underweight. We're still seeing millions of children die every year from diarrheal disease before age five. and we're increasingly seeing more and more children being born before 37 weeks of age. And for all of these health conditions, there's compelling evidence to demonstrate that breastfeeding or constituents within breast milk can help prevent these outcomes, can help treat these conditions, and can enhance human health. And this is why we're seeing uh, from the CDC and the World Health Organization transitions to this messaging about the first thousand days. So there's lots of, of information about what can happen during pregnancy, but it's really the first several years, both during pregnancy and lactation, that become quite important for optimal beginnings to promote lifelong health. And this is quite important because, as we know, science is is only as good as it is translated into practice. And in order to translate then science into practice, we absolutely have to have a significant buy-in and participation and contributions from social scientists, and I would argue particularly anthropologists. And we, we find that if you look at both governmental and non-governmental organizations, there's this overwhelming amount of messaging that Mother's milk is liquid gold and breastfeeding is the gold standard, and yet this messaging is coming while we still have, I think, an incomplete understanding of milk. So in many ways, what we know makes us, you know, uh, undeniable, but we need to know more so that we can better uh, message and better inform people making parenting decisions. And this is, I think, where anthropology comes in, and I think it explicitly is a four-field uh, area. So you have um, my area is primarily biological anthropology, but I work in different uh, human uh, populations uh, and, and end up spending a lot of time talking to women about how they perceive their identity of, as a mother and their identity as a woman. We talk about the language that's used about breastfeeding and breast milk. There's an archaeology of breastfeeding and breast milk and other kinds of infant care. Um, 
approaches. And to be clear, I am not in any way the only person that's working in these areas. You have uh, Drs. Palmquist, Maury, Quinn, Martin, Bernstein, and many others who are looking at both cultural and biological and biosocial approaches to understanding breast milk. What shapes it from the perspective of the mother? What shapes it from the perspective of the infant? And how these are affecting family dynamics, economics of the household, and infant developmental trajectories. So we're still trying to understand breast milk. But it's also not as simple as we tend to think of it, because at the store it comes in you know, whole, 2%, 1%, and blue. But this really obscures the complexity within the breast milk. So right now we know that milk contains uh, energy in the forms of fats, proteins, and sugars. It has vitamins. It has minerals. It has uh, immunofactors from the mother that protects the infant when their immune system is still developing and not able to effectively protect the baby on its own. Breast milk is a source of safe drinking water. And this is incredibly important. Um, I think a lot of people think about it as being quite important in terms of the global south. But as we're increasingly seeing due to the Flint water crisis and um, horrible lead levels in milk in many, many um, underserved communities within the United States, breast milk becomes a safer source of nutrition water um, in, in many, many contexts, even those very close to home. Uh, I recently saw um, Cami Goldhammer give a presentation about breast milk and breastfeeding within Native American, Indigenous, First Nations communities in North America. And she talked about breastfeeding and breast milk as a step toward food sovereignty for First Nations peoples. And given that a lot of reservations are characterized um, as having really substandard water systems, uh, which needs to be addressed, we also have this access to clean water to breast milk for developing infants. Less known are that milk includes hormones that signal the infant about mother's physiology. Oh, is there a question? Vernon, is there a question? Uh, I don't think so. I don't see any in the um, in the box here. Okay, I thought I heard something. Okay, so there's hormones in milk that um, signal to the infant's physiology. We now know that there are bacteria in milk, and these are um, oftentimes very beneficial, healthy bacteria. So it doesn't counter the this is safe water. And we're now starting to see that there are stem cells and other bits of DNA within milk that um, as of yet we don't understand what those do very well when ingested by the infant. But collectively, there are thousands of constituents in mother's milk. So it's important as you leave this webinar that you appreciate that milk is food, milk is medicine, and milk is signal. And these constituents can be interacting in very complicated ways that are still largely not understood. In my comparative lactation lab at Arizona State University, we work on understanding how mother's milk varies in all of these constituents, many as we can measure. We look at sources of that variation, such as maternal life history, her nutrition, her health, her, her um, other aspects of her condition. We started expanding into looking at it um, cross-culturally as a function of subsistence pattern. And we're quite interested in thinking about the integrated development of multiple systems within the infant. So not just their growth and development, not just that milk is the building blocks, but it's also shaping things like their behavior and their temperament, their immune function, their cognition, and how bacteria are colonizing them to, to help them. I'm primarily interested in, in having work that's applicable to humans, but for a variety of reasons, we also make use of animal model systems in primates, rodents, and dairy, species, dairy breeds, because these allow us to understand some of the underlying physiology or determine causal directions of patterns that are really just not ethically or logistically able to do in humans. I've done a lot of my work in the biomedical non-human primate model, the rhesus macaque, which is the most widely distributed primate after humans. 
And I work with them at the California National Primate Research Center in Davis, California. And this is one of eight national primate research centers. And they're quite important because they provide this resource um, to researchers all across the country. You don't have to be at that university to work with these animals. And I work at Davis in part because the animals live in these large outdoor enclosures um, that are half acre. So the picture that you're looking at on the screen right now represents only about an eighth of their enclosure size. And they're able to live in these groups uh, that are very similar to what you find in the wild. So close kin, distant kin, and unrelated individuals. And they engage in all of their species typical behaviors. And in this outdoor social housing, they don't develop any of the kind of behavioral problems that um, may occur to some uh, sensitive individuals in other housing conditions. Uh, this is an aerial view of the facility. Uh, in the upper corner, you can see uh, what are um, 24 different corrals. We work with multiple groups, and as I mentioned, the animals engage in all their friendly and less friendly social behaviors out in those enclosures. I'm quite interested in understanding what about human milk reflects things that are specific to human conditions versus our heritage of our, our primate ancestors. And so I've been working with a number of collaborators to try and understand what is uh, primate in human milk and what is human in human milk. And to date, we've been able to identify exceptional features of human milk in three different domains here with um, Sesame Street. And these are in the human proteome, the um, HIV cytal factors and sugars in milk that are quite important. So real quickly, if you compare the proteome of milk in a rhesus monkey to a human mother, what you find is that there's a lot of proteins that are, in co that are shared between them. However, as you can see from these green bars, the proteins coding in human breast milk are significantly higher than, than what we find in rhesus macaques for 75 out of 80 of these milk proteins. And these milk proteins are important for our digestion, our macronutrient processing, and our immune function. And what's quite exciting is that these are areas in which humans, because of our cultural practices, how we uh, gather our food, how we process our food, the kinds of foods that we're eating, uh, the fact that we live um, in social groups, uh, in many, many populations in very sedentary kinds of ways, these are going to affect how, how we acquire our nutrients, and they're also going to greatly affect the immune challenges or the disease ecologies that we encounter. There's a, one other thing that's quite interesting about humans relative to other primates, and that, of course, is how we have such incredible postnatal brain development. We, we have such large brains for our bodies. And what you find is that many of these proteins that are increased in humans relative to rhesus macaques are proteins that localize to cranial regions and may be part of what supports the brain development of human infants. Another major issue facing human public health is the HIV crisis. And what we find is that uh, a quarter of a million children become infected with HIV annually across the, across the globe. And 50% of these children are going to acquire the virus from breastfeeding in breast milk. However, 85% of infants that are breastfed by HIV-positive mothers do not ever acquire HIV. And so in this way, breast milk is both a vector of transmission and potentially a vehicle of protection. And if we can identify what compartments within breast milk um, are protective, then we have some really great resources for increasing their presence in milk and making it safer for HIV-positive mothers to breastfeed their infants. And this is quite important because for many of the people that, um, for many of the populations that have a really high rate and risk of HIV contraction, these are places in the world where you see huge threats from diarrheal disease and lack of access to clean water. And so there aren't 
particularly safe alternative to breastfeeding in many of these regions. So being able to better improve the safety of breastfeeding is a, is a, is a huge public health aim. So working with Dr. Angela Wall and Dr. Victor Garcia, we did a collaborative study looking at HIV suspended in vehicle or milk as it was administered to a uh, humanized mouse. And what you find is that when the HIV virus is suspended in just a viscous fluid that's similar to the consistency of milk but has no milk in it, 100% of the mice develop HIV, an analog of HIV. However, breast milk is more protective. And what you find is that there is a greater amount of specificity when you get closer evolutionarily to humans in terms of our relatives. So cow milk is not as dangerous as just vehicles, suggesting that there is antiviral features just as a function of it being mammalian milk. The recent data suggests that there are primate-specific antiviral features that are protective, but it's the human breast milk that's the most protective. And as of right now, we still aren't exactly sure what the constituents are within the breast milk that allow this effect of protection, but they're actively working on, on trying to track those down. Lastly, and this is, um, I think, one of the most uh, interesting areas to me, is that mother's milk does not only affect the infant directly, it's not only feeding the baby. Mother's milk includes these very complicated sugars that are utilized by the commensal bacteria that are colonizing the baby. So in placental mammals, mothers make these oligosaccharides or glycans um, that the babies don't have the enzymes to digest. They can't cleave them. They pass intact into the lower intestinal tract where they're utilized by both beneficial and potentially dangerous bacteria. And this brings us back to what are these bacteria doing? Well, they, the, the beneficial ones, not the pathogenic ones, but the beneficial ones are essential for making minerals available from our diet, so the nutrient bioavailability. And they also are essential for our immunological protection and our regulation. So as just a first step, if beneficial bacteria have colonized the intestinal tract, then pathogenic bacteria don't have any space to gain hold, right? So beneficial bacteria are a competitive inhibitor of the invasion of pathogenic bacteria. But they also, these bacteria, are directly signaling and communicating with our immune system and alerting our immune system to the presence of pathogenic bacteria and helping us uh, to fight them. It's a very uh, cooperative, co-evolutionary process. But as I mentioned earlier, our nutrients that we're consuming and the immune challenges that we're facing are going to be anchored to our cultural context. And so there's an expanded amount of interest in understanding how individual human populations are, are shaped uh, in, their, in their milk production and their bacteria. If we look at the, these specialized sugars across the primates for which we have information, what you find is that humans are producing very different oligosaccharides, these specialized sugars. So we have a, a greater abundance of different types of them. They are much more elaborate than in any of the other primates studied to date. And they form a much bigger compartment within the breast milk. So it's the third most common constituent within breast milk. Um, on a dry matter basis after uh, lactose and fat. So it's, it's, milk is complicated. And it's not standardized. So when I talk about the food medicine and signal within milk, one of the important things is that each mother is making her own unique profile of all of these constituents. It's every constituent that I've looked at within a mother, whether it's fats, proteins, or sugars, or the oligosaccharides, or the immunofactors, or the hormones, every mother differs, right? There's variation. And some of the variation is quite interesting. So we found that the biological recipe for milk is different for daughters and sons. So when we think about how sons and daughters may have different developmental priorities or trajectories, they may be differentially costly to the mother, 
or they may have different reproductive potential in terms of the grand offspring they'll produce and on what timeline, we're now seeing signatures of these sex differences in the milk. So, sorry, there we go. So one of the things is that in the rhesus monkey's eye study, we find that mothers make much more milk for daughters, they may like uh, richer milk for sons, but they make higher mineral content for daughters. And I'm very careful to not say that they're making better milk for one offspring, gender, or sex than the other, rather that they are making it tailored to the developmental priorities of each. So if we look closer at like the minerals, for example, what we know is that the skeletons of daughters develop faster in monkeys, chimpanzees, and humans. Katie, can you can you still hear us? I'm not sure if we've lost Katie. Is anybody else having a problem hearing Katie? I can't hear her now. I could hear her a minute ago. Yeah, I'm not well. Okay. And here, this case with uh, humans, there's some data that it's um, higher in sons and sometimes higher in daughters. Sometimes. Vernon, can you hear me? I can hear you, but I think you're uh, going in and out a little bit. Um, it just said that you muted me. Oh dear. Are you? Are can, can you? Can folks hear Katie now? Can you hear me? Yes, can we hear can hear you now. Okay. 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 Um, where did I? Where did I go out? Probably about uh, a minute, maybe a minute and a half ago was where the first uh, uh, gap happened. Okay. So did you guys see this slide? I think we were on the last slide when... Uh... Okay. So basically we're finding that there is evidence across different mammals for either increases for daughters or increases for sons, or depending on the constituent, increases for, for sons or daughters, like um, as demonstrated by purple in this human silhouette here. What's quite exciting is that in the last uh, few months, a paper came out showing that the actual genetic, um, the gene expression within the milk producing cells of the mammary gland is different after gestating a son or a daughter, uh, adding to our understanding of, of how the different synthesis of milk is, is coming about. There's also been, um, oh, so so that's, I'm quite interested in differences for sons and daughters and what that means. But I'd also like to think about what is happening during infancy. This is a critical period of mother-infant interaction, um, attachment bonding, as uh, discussed extensively by John Bowlby and, and Mary Ainsworth. This is a period when infants are exploring their environment, so they're gaining knowledge about their environment, but also being exposed to a number of risks. And this is also a period of, of gaining social experience and playing. So all of this is being fueled and framed by the milk that mothers are synthesizing. And we're now seeing the beginning of, I think, a very uh, wonderful field of research in understanding how mother's milk shapes the behavioral development of young. It's very new. So to date, there's been a handful of studies showing that mother's milk shapes temperament. So in uh, rodents, they've, uh, when they administer glucocorticoids, sometimes referred to as the quote unquote stress hormone, but that's a little bit tricky. When they administer this to moms in their water, it ends up being in their milk that the pups then drink. And the pups that are exposed to these glucocorticoids or corticosterone in rodents have a different behavioral phenotype. So they're less behaviorally inhibited and more exploratory in a novel setting. So this is a classic rodent experiment known as the elevated plus maze. 
And what you have are two arms of the plus maze that are open to the world and two that are next to what, what the rodent perceives as a wall. Rodents tend to be more cautious. They spend more time by the wall. But if they explore open areas, that's a measure of their boldness or their, of their um, lack of anxiety. In humans, they found that milk cortisol is associated with temperament um, in kind of the opposite pattern. So higher glucocorticoids in milk are associated with more fear, sadness, discomfort, anger, frustration, and reduced suitability. And this effect, um, only measured at a single time point, was uh, found to be strong for daughters, but not for sons. And most recently, our group has published a paper showing that the glucocorticoids in milk in monkeys is more similar to what we find in humans, not like what we find in the rodents. So uh, higher glucocorticoids in early lactation predict more nervousness, less confidence in daughters, but it's a change across lactation that predict it in sons. So the pattern's the same, but the critical windows here are different. This is quite important because it could be that the earlier work in humans just didn't get the right critical window for sons the way they did for daughters. And this is why it's quite important to think about sex differentiated milk as two sides of a coin. There's the potential differences in how mothers are producing milk, but there's also potential differences in how infants are utilizing and absorbing the milk between sons and daughters. So if you look at the glucocorticoid concentration in milk of rhesus monkeys, it's the same for sons and daughters, but the effects are different at different time points. So this is, I think, another piece to the puzzle that we need to think very hard about. And lastly, for the milk portion of the talk, I want to address the issue as to whether or not breast milk is of minor importance. We see a lot of articles talking about how breast milk is not that different than formula and that it's being oversold by lactivists and other kinds of, of extreme activists that are pushing uh, public health messaging beyond what the science can support. And I think that this is an absolutely essential and important area to be thinking about because the fact of the matter is, is that most mothers in the United States intend to breastfeed. They're, over 90% of women report, at least, that they would like to breastfeed. And then they encounter a number of obstacles. And these obstacles can be that we don't have paid parental leave in this country. They have obstacles in that they don't have uh, support of a social network. They uh, do not perceive that they have um, appropriate clinical support when they encounter challenges. And this, this, these are, are institutional, structural things that need to be addressed and they need to be resolved. And, and so the continuous messaging about the importance of breast milk doesn't necessarily help moms navigate these obstacles. It is intended, I think, to motivate them to navigate those obstacles, but that is, um, that's not enough, and that's insufficient, and that's problematic, and that can be counterproductive. And to be fair, it's really important to understand that for some infants, the effect sizes of the differences between getting breast milk and getting formula are going to be very small. And that is the point that is really being pushed in these more recent articles. However, that is, I think, an incredibly privileged attitude because it is really focused on the full-term, typically developing infant that is growing up in an incredibly protected and nurturing space where other things can um, buffer the infant from challenges or are compensating for other kinds of deficits. So breast milk effect sizes can be the difference between life and death for a neonatal intensive care unit baby that's born at 28 weeks of gestational age. Right? We know that formula can imperil these infants by facilitating the invasion of pathogenic bacteria. I already talked about access to clean water and, and, and um, 
and immunizations and other things that present a lot of challenges for people that aren't growing up in upper middle class America. In many urban areas within the United States, you have increased risk for the development of autoimmune disorders, allergies, uh, asthma, and in those situations, although we still don't have a good understanding of it, there's the expectation that breast milk may be incredibly important for helping protect the infant's immune system during this period of development. And lastly, while we can have individual messaging to individual mothers to say, you know, you are in Colorado Springs, you are not encountering a lot of infectious disease, your baby is born full term, you're going to do all these other things that help, to, you know, cognitive development, you know, the effect sizes for you are, are, are going to be quite small. The baby's going to have a slightly elevated risk of being overweight or having a few more earaches in childhood. But that's the conversation you have with an individual mother. If you then think about it across the millions of families within the United States, you're talking about significant healthcare impact, healthcare costs. And so we have to think about this not just in the best case scenario or in the solitary case, but we need to think about the diversity of mothers and babies and the complexity of aggregated decisions across large populations. So this is why when I talk about mother's milk is liquid gold and a gold standard, it's important to think about what do we mean by liquid gold standards and for whom. So we know, and I talked about this a bit, and some of it I didn't have time to get into, but the, the milk varies as a function of whether or not moms are rural or urban, depending on their nutritional and disease ecology. We know that individual characteristics of the mother are important for her milk synthesis, and aspects of the infant are also shaping the, the milk that the mammary gland is producing in these complex biofeedback ways. And so right now, we need to think about how to to harness this information to deliver better health care and better public health messaging. Oh, also, all these things are likely interacting in ways we don't know yet. So let's just, for example, take the neonatal intensive care unit situation. Right now, many doctors are saying that breast milk is better than a milk substitute or an artificial breast milk or formula, mother's milk donor milk and milk products. But unlike bone marrow, donors or blood donors or organ donors in which they attempt to match the donor and the recipient. Nobody's doing that with milk. They're treating milk as though it is standardized like in the dairy aisle at the grocery store. And this, I think, is um, a missed opportunity for better targeted care. So we can think about milk versus precision milk. Precision milk being something about where you match. Do you match milk for the, for the infant sex? for the time of day that it's collected, for the population that you're working in? Can you select milks that are going to maybe have added value for that infant? So maternal parity or her genotype, there's differences in the oligosaccharides that mothers make depending on their genotype. Are there ways to provide additives to milk that is, is provided in neonatal intensive care, intensive care units where you give them more complex oligosaccharides or better microbial content. And how can we take all of this information to make better precision milk substitutes? Right now, formulas are incredibly limited in what they provide to the developing neonate, and yet so many mothers, for economic, for cultural, for medical reasons, absolutely rely on infant formulas to support their babies. And we owe it to those mothers to provide them with the best and better options um, continuously. And, and that, I think, is a really important, important part to this dialogue. So if you are a mother or a baby, or you love mothers and babies, we need to be thinking harder about how do we remove institutional and cultural barriers? How do we uh, provide more economic opportunities and how do we provide mothers the spaces for them to pursue the infant feeding strategies that they want to and, and support them in all of those manifestations? So that um, is my, my kind of milk part of my talk. 
and I'm happy to do a question and answer about that right now before I go on to the other two parts about being an academic online and about how to make uh, uh, the academic environment more inclusive, or I can just keep going through. It's up to you guys, whatever people prefer. What do you guys think? Can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hi, this is Brett. Um, Hi, Brett. I, I wasn't sure if my microphone was working, and I, so I typed in my question. Um, Specifically, I was thinking about this precision milk and how it might be a problem, um, a political problem, uh, to target certain groups of neonates with coming from different socioeconomic positions or racial groups. Um, and I was thinking about just some discussion that I've heard recently about a pushback uh, considering racially targeted medicine. Um, so right. I was just wanting to uh, kind of so pick your brain and see what you yeah. think about that. I'm not suggesting that this be decided. I'm not advocating for race-based medicine um, at all. I think um, for very good reasons, uh, people's experience of race is uh, affecting their biology, but that's different than there being biological underpinnings to race. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then one of the other things that we're running into is that there is this very complicated bioethical situation in which new corporations are buying breast milk from women hmm. to produce these um, clinical interventions for neonatal intensive care units. And that is, in and of itself, an entire multi-day workshop. <laughs> to unpack the, the predatory practices that um, are going into that situation. Yeah. On the other hand, the, that's where women are being paid for their breast milk. There's also the uh, Human Association, North America, there's, 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 there's the milk banking network within North America and it's expanding globally. And this is, different, this is where women are donating uh, their leftover breast milk or their oversupply. There's no economic incentive for them to provide it. Many women um, know about the importance of breast milk and are very altruistically giving their breast milk to these donor banks. So the idea about precision milk, um, I think, is a dimension independent from some of the bioethical considerations of how the, the donor milk is being, so, is being made available. And uh, and I think that this is one of the key reasons why the bench scientists or the the industry cannot be pursuing these things in the absence of serious participation and contributions from anthropologists. Mm -hmm. All right. Th thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Any other questions? It's probably we can just probably just go on then. Okay. All right. So the next little this is this next part's a lot shorter, but um I talk about breast milk science and other aspects of navigating um online spaces as an academic at my blog, Mammal Suck Milk. And um this is just the, the current as you can see, I have a science outreach activity that's happening right now known as Mammal March Madness. Uh, I uh, last month posted an essay about breast milk and baby spit, which got over 50,000 page views. And then the other three there are different aspects of how to be an academic and, and navigate new challenges within academia. So these are things about how we change our academic culture, how we engage in academic blogging, and then how we uh, navigate open access publications. So um, these are just the top five most recent posts um, that there's over 60 on the blog currently. 
And it really comes down to I science on the internet and, and so should you. And I expect since you guys are engaged in this webinar online, you already are sciencing on the internet. We're sciencing on the internet at this exact moment. And so I, I realize that you are not entirely my target demographic because you're already utilizing these tools and resources. And it's really about pushing back on this perception that these online spaces are a distraction from what we should really be doing as academics, um, that we should always be doing our research papers and not off having fun on the internet. But the fact of the matter is that the internet is changing global dialogues. More and more people from all across the world are participating in these spaces, and they have been hugely instrumental in, in the democratization of our society, but also the democratization of our disciplines. So for so long, academic spaces were uh, structured in a way that particularly benefited individuals who had extra money to travel to conferences and workshops and opportunities to talk, who had um, the relaxation of household responsibilities such that they were able to travel. That, um, and those, those spaces led to the emergence of social networks that were in. And, and this is part of the accumulated disparities that we see within academia and how uh, certain demographics have been uh, historically and still uh, contemporarily favored within that context. The internet is disrupting that in very important ways. People can participate in exchanging intellectual ideas, they can build communities, they can build opportunities, and they can do all of this from their office and their home. It no longer requires money to travel. It no longer requires relaxation of household responsibilities. Uh, and, and that, I think, is an incredibly important thing. And so academics who are not engaged in these dialogues are basically abdicating a seat at the table. They're missing out on opportunities to talk with their colleagues, and they're missing out on opportunities to talk with policymakers and the general public. And in today's climate of academic funding and political processes, we cannot ethically, morally, socially, professionally uh, abdicate those roles any longer. So, that's kind of my big picture, it's a moral good, but a lot of times people want to know how can it directly benefit their CV in a way that is convincing to uh, our more senior colleagues that don't understand that these spaces are now essential. And so I'm going to kind of run through some key things that we've accomplished, or that I've accomplished specifically because of how I navigate being an academic online. So I already mentioned my blog. I wrote a blog post about differences in milk for sons and daughters. I called it boy milk and girl milk and, and wrote an essay. And then I tweeted about it um, on, on the Twitter. And, and if anybody that's still following the webinar, if you don't have a Twitter account, get a Twitter account. It is, I think, the most important academic space online right now. I posted the essay there, and it was read by a dairy scientist, Barry Bradford, at Kansas State University. And he messaged me through Twitter and said, hey, I think we could do some really cool stuff with dairy cows, looking at differences in milk production after sons and daughters. And I said, yeah, we can. I just didn't know any dairy scientists. And he's like, well, now you do. So we did a study, and we found that the effect of sex-differentiated milk is in part programmed during pregnancy. And we did a really, really, really cool study um, that was published in PLOS One. We published it open access, which ended up being a really important thing because almost all dairy scientists don't have access to the primary literature of, of their industry. And so because we published this open access, here's this figure shows that the fetal sex on the first pregnancy affects the first two lactations and the pregnancy, the second pregnancy also affects an already established lactation. Really cool data. And I will never have a 
big sample size like that again. <laughs> so um, we we published it and it got picked up by the New York Times and they did art for it, which I was so excited about. And it ended up having really huge impact, both in terms of shaping dairy science in the next year. So multiple research teams have replicated our work now. It's changed how the industry approaches uh, the timing of, of, of conception and, and milk production and has continued to have long-lasting uh, effects on the dialogues. I also, so this is, um, this shows my page views for my blog um, up until a couple days ago, uh, last Friday. And I'll draw your attention to these peaks that happen. And those are every year in March. And that's because I run uh, with my colleagues, Josh Drew, uh, Christy Luton, who's a paleoanthropologist, and Chris Anderson, uh, this Mammal March Madness science outreach activity every, every, every March in conjunction with the basketball tournament. And basically, we put together a major animal bracket and then discuss the science underlying what would happen if these two animals encountered each other to battle. And people play this game. Like, thousands of people are playing this game. All different ages, in classrooms, in their families, um, and we're seeing it uh, generally become a bigger and more elaborate effort every year. So here's an example of we, we live tweet all of these battles online. Uh, this is the wild card bout from 2014, which was written by Christy Luton who compared what would happen if uh, A. afarensis were to fight um, uh, Sediba, these two hominin species. And as you can see, these are the tweets that go through. And then these are archived in Storify so that they're always available. And people have actually gone back and they play off March cycle with their kids during other parts of the year. So this demonstrates um, a lot of different, it's a, it's a lot of work, but it has grown in ways that now the National Science Foundation is highlighting it um, as a, a model broader impact. Uh, my program officers at NSF actually play in the tournament, and I always get really nervous if one of their like favorite animals ends up losing. <laughs> but but it ends up being this really great thing. And then actually uh, about 10 minutes before we started the webinar today, um, the mammal tournament got covered in nature, which of course is one of the most um, prestigious science uh, publications in, my, in, in bioanthropology and, and other science fields. So this is a huge new layer to the legitimacy of what we're doing. But it, it doesn't just have to be that Twitter and, and Sorify are for you know, these kinds of science outreach activities to the general public. I've also used them to great advantage at conferences. So I've created Storifies from tweets during sessions here at the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And what I do is I, I archive all of the individual tweets, but then I also annotate them by providing the abstract, links to the articles, um, information about the scholar and the researcher. And in this way, I promote not just my area of science, but also my work and my colleagues' work, and that has a lot of added value. So this, I think, these online spaces are a really important and essential component of the academics toolkit. And as academics, we, we have these growth attitudes where we constantly enhance our approaches to our scholarship. And when I talk about growth attitudes, that isn't just in the context of how we use online spaces, that this is really important to have growth attitudes to make the culture of our scholarship better. So as many of you likely know, I participated in a study of understanding what people are experiencing when they conduct field research. Um, so this is, this is me as a, a bitty scientist in 2001, before I went to graduate school, I'm in Indonesia hanging out with uh, Macaca nigra, the Sulawesi macaque. And as anthropologists, depending on your particular 
the research area. Field work is really important for the, the research we do, and it can become really important for getting jobs. So if you look through the job ads on the AAA career website, what you will find is over and over, search committees are really interested in hiring people that have active field research programs. And this is a problem if we are not making sure that these field spaces are safe. So in collaboration with uh, professors Robin Nelson, Kate Clancy, and Julian Rutherford, we launched the Survey of Academic Field Experiences in 2013, uh, known by the hashtag Safe13. And we published it, again, open access, which was quite important so that people could see everything about what we did. And to remind you, if you're not already, even if you are familiar here, we had 666 participants. They were um, overwhelmingly reflective of the demographics of anthropology in America, most unfortunately. A majority of individuals were trainees. They, 75% uh, of our respondents came from anthropology and archaeology. But in general, if you look at all the different disciplines represented, there were 32 spanning social life and physical sciences. And importantly, these are people that had substantial experience. Katie, it seems like we've lost you again. Uh, I can't hear you. I don't think I've done anything to mute you. I'm going to turn you off and back on and see if that helps. Katie, can you hear me? Uh, can anybody else out there hear me? I can hear you. I can hear okay. you. I can hear you. Great. Let's see if we can't get Katie back here. Hello, Katie. Can you hear me? Okay, we're uh, trying to get Katie back on the line right now. Um, seems like she's gone offline. Uh, her PowerPoint is still showing on my screen at least. Uh, oh, Katie. Oh, she's still going right along. I don't think there's any way to reach her. Katie, we've lost you again. Can you hear me now? Okay, now yeah. you're back. Okay, I think yeah. we lost about two or three minutes there. Oh, no. Um, when you lose me, you can just hit my mute button, and that always notices me. I always notice that. Okay. Um, I tried turning you off and on a couple of times, but it didn't seem like it did, it did any good. Huh, weird. Um, it could be that, you know, I'm on my laptop and sometimes the signal gets interrupted here if it doesn't think I'm actually doing anything. But I am, okay. obviously. Yeah, we didn't lose your screen, actually. Okay. Well, that's weird. Um, okay, so where – did you lose me on this slide or this – one slide before that. You lost me here. Yeah, I think – yes. I think that's about where okay. you were. So on this slide, I basically just read – the slide to you. Um, so I think if people are following along, they got that information, right? Hello? 
Okay, let's uh, let's go with we probably got that. Okay. Um, so basically, I just I'll I'll just um, I'll just say that these are people that have a lot of experience, and anthropologists were particularly well represented within this data set, and that we ask people about their specific ex experiences because methodologically you can't ask people were you sexually harassed, were you sexually assaulted. Because people's working definitions of those things are highly variable and oftentimes not consistent with the actual law. So you have to ask people about particular kinds of experiences that are underlying hostile work environment, underlying sexual harassment, underlying sexual assault. Okay? Okay. All right. So I'm going to start back here and um, and this basically just shows the data that each one of these red dots is a person that was responded to our survey and then was navigating spaces where they were experiencing comments that are known to contribute to a hostile gendered work environment, that they were experiencing unwanted physical contact. And yet many people were not aware of a mechanism to report their experiences. If they tried to report it, very few of them were satisfied by the outcome of their reporting. And this is a problem. There's problems all the way around on this, okay? Because it shows that this is happening. It's happening to an appreciable number of people. And we do not have mechanisms in place and training in place to respond to these things when they do happen. And when the paper published, it was like a gut, I mean, it was, a, it was really traumatic to do the study, but um, people would write about how this figure, here you have this per, one citizen saying, figure three hits you like a brick, because you realize that those are people, and if, and if you don't realize they're people, they'll tell you. So this is a respondent who said, I was part of the survey and one of these dots. And it made me realize that nobody had really been talking about this. And so many people after the study published came up and said, thank you for doing this. I didn't think anybody wanted to talk about it. I thought I was alone. And this figure lets everybody know that if you are experiencing these things, you are not alone and there's a community that is responding to them. There are, however, still <laughs> a long way to go. So when I was analyzing the data from the study, this is an artist representation based on respondent demographics, we would get comments in the survey that said things like, there's no place to say this, but it's important. The vast majority of unwanted sexual harassment I've seen has been local men versus academic females. And then things like, I don't see any other place in this survey to report this, so I'll put it here. Over the past 21 years, I'm not aware of any cases at these field sites of male researchers sexually touching female researchers without their permission. And this, these were people responding to the survey before they saw the data. And it just goes to show you that many of our colleagues are at best very naive because the data show unequivocally that it is happening within the research team. And arguments that are saying that this is basically about being embedded in a different culture um, and that this isn't about things that are happening within the research team is problematic both because it's racist oftentimes or uh, privileged, but it also is incredibly misleading and it's allowed us to ignore the realities of what is happening at field sites. Since we published this paper, its impact has, it's, it's probably going to be the work that I did that has had the most impact. It's um, one of the top discussed articles in the history of PLOS, which produces thousands of articles. It was covered widely by the news media. Other journals, uh, this is one of my favorite tweets, it was the Canadian Field Naturalist Journal, and it said, we don't tweet research in other journals except this. 
to just demonstrate how incredibly important everybody found, uh, many people found this research. It was one of the top 100 articles of PLOS that year, and it demonstrates that this was just step one. Awareness. This is a problem. We need to be talking about it. We need to be addressing it. But we really need to move on to step two, which is changing our culture. And culture change requires three, I argue, key things. We need to think about intersectionality. We need to think about impact, not intent. And we need to have growth attitudes. So intersectionality, we did this study, and it was organized primarily around gender. And part of that is because too much of academia remains a white space. Women have been very effective at entering academia, maybe not staying as much as they would prefer, but there are enough women that we can actually collect data. But we need to think about how this information about the gendered experiences within academia informs us to think about other experiences of marginalization, of harassment, and abuse. We need to think about race, faith, nationality, age, uh, disability statuses, and all of their intersections. We need to make these spaces more inclusive. We need to move the dialogue from intent to impact. We see over and over when somebody has transgressed against a colleague, they always hide behind, well, that wasn't my intent, or I was just making a joke, or, you know, they should have, you know, they shouldn't be bothered by what I've done. And we focus the dialogue on the perpetrator's intent, when we should be reorienting the discussion to the impact, that we should understand that our words and our actions, whether intended to or not, can have dramatic impacts on our colleagues. These are microaggressions all the way to uh, problematic sexual harassment and sexual assault. And that by reorienting the dialogue around impact, it's not enough to say that you have benign intent. Because if you really intend to be a good citizen within our community, you will understand and care about the impact. So you don't get to say intent and think that that is legitimate. And lastly, growth attitudes. In our science, our social science, our life science, whatever your approach, we are constantly talking about how we're improving our methods, our techniques, our model systems, our analytical approaches, our, how we cite the literature. We pay attention to new papers that come out, new presentations people give at the meeting in November. We refine our theory. In every way about being an academic and a scholar, there is an attitude of growth in our scholarship. We need to have that same growth attitude about how we improve, the community of scholars, and embrace inclusivity and equal opportunity. It's not enough to discuss that we need to do better in terms of diversity. We need to make sure that all of the diverse people that we have in our community are having equal opportunities, that they are navigating the same spaces, and that they aren't encountering obstacles that are unfairly impacting them in general. So. That is my presentation. Thank you for your patience in light of our technical difficulties. And I'm now happy to talk about anything that I've presented or other things that people are thinking about. Okay, I have a question here from uh, Megan Mulkerin. She says, what about risk adverse uh, anthropology departments who do not advocate speaking out for any kind of advocacy efforts? <sighs> That is shitty. <laughs> um, let me see if I can get any. Um, let me stop sharing my desktop and see if I can get video. Nope. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, I think it would be helpful if you guys could see me while we talk. Um, that. Um, that's a problem. Departments that have that attitude are uh, making sure that they will be obsolete, period. 
uh, esoteric attention to theory and not thinking about how that impacts society, not dialoguing broadly beyond the ivory tower, not um, demonstrating the importance to the social public good is going to mean that that department is obsolete. If you look at the list of research studies that Congress targeted at NSF for critical congressional oversight, which I'm not supporting, it's a huge problem, a, a significant proportion of those studies were in anthropology. Anthropologists are, by not engaging, by not being present, by not participating, are making it so that we do not own the narrative of our scholarship. And that means that that narrative gets taken over by congressional members with, the, you know, with access to grind or a general public that doesn't understand that anthropology is important. And, uh, and that those departments are making a mistake. Now, I recognize that students are not necessarily the best messengers of that. And what I would recommend thinking about is how to slow play that if you want to change the culture of your department. So sprinkle small statements in with different faculty and find out if there are any allies to your, your perspective and vision within the faculty and build the conversations from there. Share articles in your journal clubs um, sh with prestigious people within our community, within your subfield. Uh, message appropriately about these issues. Find ways to float that among your community. That's if you are interested in changing the culture of your department. And not everybody is interested in doing that. It's a ton of work. It's really hard. And a lot of people have things that they need to do for their own personal career development instead of fixing everything. In which case, I would say, if these are things that matter to you, find ways to navigate those spaces but don't advertise them within the department or in front of the people that are going to diminish and disparage them. So it's, um, it's not a great solution, but it is one. Okay, great. Are there any other questions? Uh... Uh, Megan follows up by saying, and yet because of privileged position, they will never be obsolete because of the power invested in name recognition. Everyone does it, excited for general access, science, and Twitter, but it's not important until plus or nature picks it up, you know? Uh, right. I mean, and that's, that's one of the reasons why I spend a lot of time messaging about this stuff, right? So I got tenure in four years. I get invited to give lots of talks. I have lines on my CD that are explicitly because I do activism and outreach. And, and I talk about that because I think it's really important that our senior or otherwise, you know, other colleagues start to understand how important these spaces are. And um, the thing is that, yeah, there are big names, but eventually they're not going to – I've sat on panels doing grant reviews at NSF. And Broader impacts matter. Broader impacts are a major part of that conversation. And, um, and we're seeing that a little bit more emphatically in the life sciences wing of NSF than the social sciences wing of NSF, but they're going to get there too. Um, NIH, explicitly about how does your work translate to improving the human condition. Um, we're, we're basically seeing a, a a uh, crisis of funding, and people can be prestigious now, but if it starts affecting their ability to deliver their scholarship, then you're going to see a new ascendant set of scholars that are prestigious that are doing these things. So the culture is changing. It's just different places are changing on different timelines. Okay, are there any other questions? I have a question. This is Brett speaking again. Um, I was thinking, or I just wanted to ask sort of how you find a balance um, with obviously generating really um, innovative scholarship and, um, and your outreach. Because that's, right. that's a really difficult balance to find, I've found anyways. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's a nightmare to try and get that balance, um, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> um, and like my colleagues all know that March is like my personal hellscape where I just have no bandwidth for hardly anything above just keeping the plates from falling to the ground. Um, I think that there's a couple ways to think about it. I, I, I'm not the best at managing my time. Um, I do, I say yes to too many things. I do too many things. Um, and that is partly because I really enjoy a lot of the outreach and social media stuff. Um, I tend to do it as much as I can after work hours, um, so that's part of my personal time. And if I wasn't doing that, there's, you know, other than when grant deadlines are happening or there's a major reason to push through some data, that's my time. And the idea that that time would be replaced by research if I weren't doing social media outreach or things like that, that's not a, that's not fair expectation, right? So you have academics that run marathons, you have academics that um, do a, a lot of different kinds of hobbies. It just so happens that my hobby is part of my scholarly persona. And so that's one other thing is that I, I tend to try and message about that I do these things as much as I can out, outside of work hours insofar as I have energy for them. That's good advice. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not always successful at it. Some days, you know, but, but similarly, I work I do scholarship on the weekends. I write papers, I write grants, I write, you know, manuscript reviews. You know, we, we have, you know, flexible time accounting. And, you know, you just try and make sure that it works mm -hmm. as much as you can. But I would also recommend that, especially for trainees, blogging is not, I think, a high priority as a trainee. I think this is something to, to think about doing as you become faculty. Um, in part because it's really important to develop your academic writing skills early on. And, and, and academic writing and blog writing are so different that, um, that some people that do a lot of blog writing before they've gotten really um, routine at academic writing have a hard time code switching between them. Okay, well, it looks like this is about the last call for questions. If anybody else would like to uh, put something in, please uh, please do so now. Either uh, type it in or um, uh, or if your microphone is on, please uh, uh, please let us hear it. I'm also happy to answer emails, probably not super fast because it's March, but if you want to chat with me at the meeting or over email or some other time, don't hesitate to get in touch. Okay, well, great. That looks like it. And uh, Katie, thank you very much for your uh, your really outstanding presentation. And for all of you who are still online and would like to um, uh, have a copy of this, we should have this on the website hopefully within a week or so. And um, if you have any questions or feed, feedback, please don't feel free, or please do feel free to uh, email it here. Uh, you can email me directly, Vernon Horn at V-H-O-R-N at AmericanAnthro.org. And so if that's uh, all there is, then we'll uh, sign off. And again, thanks very much for attending, and we'll hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks. Bye.